Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, a podcast show that delivers cutting edge ideas for the professionals specializing in pediatric dentistry. Thank you for tuning into Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to you and your practice. Brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. I'm your host, Joel Berg, and thank you to our Pedo Teeth Talk sponsor, Hugh Freedy, for helping us bring you great content. We couldn't do this without them. Visit them at www.hughfreedy.com. That's H-U-F-R-I-E-D-Y.com. We're here today with Dr. John Molinari. Dr. Molinari is Professor Emeritus at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry, where he served for 32 years as Chairman of Biomedical Sciences and Director of Infection Control. He has also been Director of Infection Control at the Dental Advisor in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where his laboratory was involved in research studying new infection control technologies and products. He has published over 500 scientific articles, reports, and chapters in the areas of microbiology and immunology, and lectures nationally and internationally on topics dealing with infectious diseases and infection control. Dr. Molinari is also co-author of the text, Catone's Practical Infection Control in Dentistry. Thank you so much, Dr. Molinari. You are the expert in this field, and I'm so grateful that you're here with us today. You're very kind, Joel. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. It's our pleasure. So I want to start our conversation talking about what may be the most important part of this conversation, and that is about hand hygiene. You know, we, you know, being on hospital staffs, we're always getting admonished to make sure that we wash our hands. They do these random checks, and sometimes we see that our physician colleagues maybe aren't even as good as we are, but I think we can't be reminded enough about hand hygiene. So I wanted to ask you, is there anything new we should know about hand hygiene practice uh, practices, such as potential for increasing microbial resistance, uh, dermatitis, hand lotions. That's a lot to to capture, but can you talk about hand hygiene, please? Certainly, I'd be happy to. The basic principles of hand washing, which are now called hand hygiene, haven't changed. Cleaning hands is crucial. You can remove over 98% of any potential problems just with washing your hands correctly. Obviously, the uh, waterless hand antiseptics have helped dramatically because they are more rapid and they can kill higher concentrations of organisms in shorter times. But the basic principles haven't changed. The problem is, as usual, compliance. And one of the things that has been seen in laboratories, not clinically, is that is with non-compliance with even something like the high alcohol hand antiseptics, certain hospital pathogens are becoming more tolerant of these. Not that good hand hygiene practices don't work, but you need to do them effectively, especially in areas where you may have a real potential for for transmission. As far as dentists go, pediatric dentists and other healthcare professionals, the issue of dermatitis still remains a problem. And that also requires uh, compliance with good hand washing, hand hygiene practices. One of the things that I I routinely see and and hope to be able to to tell people about is that if there is any beginnings of dermatitis on somebody's hands and you're washing your hands, that area of irritation needs to be rinsed better than the rest of your hand because the soap will adhere more tenaciously to the broken down epithelium. And then if you don't remove it, you just dry your hands, think it's okay, you put your gloves on, you perspire, and that reactivates that soap, and that can make the dermatitis get worse. And so you're talking about, I'm sorry, when you say dermatitis, you're talking about caused by what? Irritation from what? Caused by uh, washing uh, with hot water, where you uh, increase the epithelial permeability, uh, you uh, don't wash long enough, you have areas of irritation already, and they, they can uh, hold the soap. Uh, and so it needs to be rinsed properly. Uh, sometimes people uh, have very fair skin, and so washing with an antimicrobial antiseptic can actually increase dermatitis because the antimicrobials can increase the uh, permeability of the skin and remove some of the oils and lipids. This is why some people, for non-surgical procedures, can wash their hands with just plain liquid soap and water mm. because you're accomplishing the basic tenet, which is cleaning. 
The physical uh, people, removal of the pathogens. Exactly. Uh, mm-hmm, people mm-hmm. think they have to have an antimicrobial. You don't. For non-surgical procedures, you can use a plain liquid soap. Uh, fortunately, uh, the whole area, you, you mentioned this, of uh, hand lotions has increased. There have been many good uh, waterless hand lotions that have appeared on the market over the years, and these work well. Uh, one of the things that has come up in recent years is that they are, there's a new generation of hand lotions. Uh, to be brief with this, and I hope you don't mind giving me giving some representative products. It's not that I got a commission no, on what do. people are using. Yeah, please do. But uh, oh, this is no, not that many years ago, a uh, a uh, new hand lotion, new generation lotion came out from Eufridi. Uh, it's called Hand Essentials Skin Repair Cream. And the reason why I mention this, and I can't mention any others because they're still in developmental stages that I don't know of, is this product not only is a, is a good lubricant, it's a water-based lubricant that works its way in well, but it has an added ingredient called dimethicone. And for those people who are familiar with diaper rash creams, mm. dimethicone is the active ingredient in diaper rash creams to heal chapped skin. Nice. So this is actually a tissue healer. We perform studies at the dental advisor on this, uh, clinical studies in winter in Michigan. And dang, if the people's hands didn't appear much, much better within a week uh, from some very bad chap skin dermatitis irritation. So I think we're seeing some solutions, but the bottom line is people need to be compliant in washing hands properly, rinsing properly. If they're using... uh, waterless antiseptics you need to use them for the proper lengths of time otherwise the microorganisms in hospital settings are already starting to adapt to this and becoming more tolerant well that's all great to know thank you so much you know we could spend the whole session just on hand hygiene but i want to ask one quick follow-up and that is currently we're hearing about the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, mainly in china but spreading slowly to other countries Hand hygiene is going to be a big part of prevention, is it not? Absolutely. It's, it, it is the basic, most fundamental uh, infection control procedure. And uh, keeping hands clean, keeping them free of transient organisms such as coronaviruses or any other uh, foreign organisms is crucial. And especially when using gloves, you need to clean hands before you put on gloves. So uh, the basic recommendations from CDC, World Health Organizations, all the agencies is You need to practice good, effective hand hygiene. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So I want to shift gears and talk briefly about uh, hepatitis B. Uh, I had my vaccinations, the series, uh, years ago. Are there any updates concerning this hepatitis B vaccination? At this point, there isn't a recommendation for a booster. Uh, As you know, the first vaccine came out in 1982. Uh, I I received it within a month after it came out in Michigan. Uh, And... The studies that have been done showed that immunologic memory lasts well over 30 years, and we're approaching 40 years in a couple of years. So this seems to be a very good long-lasting vaccine. The key is to make sure that people get a test to show that they've responded to the vaccine. That they have the titer. That they uh, have the titer for it. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And by having that, at this point, your immunologic memory is going to last an extended period of time. One of the new things that's come out recently, uh, I believe was November of 2017, is uh, that there was a new generation of hepatitis B vaccine came out called Heplosav B. Uh, H-E-P-L-A, L-I, anyway, it's Heplosav B. I'm screwing up the the We can find it, I'm sure. Thank you. And this is the same antigen, hepatitis B surface antigen, but the adjuvant, to stimulate the immune response is more efficient than earlier generations of adjuvants. And in tests that uh, they have done with this, they have seen a far higher level of responsiveness in individuals who normally would not respond to the hepatitis B vaccine. People with immune compromised conditions, uh, 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 brittle diabetics, some of the other uh, immune compromised individuals that might not respond well. In some other studies, they also found that people who didn't respond to earlier hepatitis B vaccines had a better chance of responding to this one. Not that they automatically would, 
but there was a higher percentage of non-responders who responded to this Heplosad B. So mm. I think this is, this is the new generation of hepatitis B vaccine that we're probably going to be seeing for our children, our grandchildren, later generations of healthcare workers. It's just an advanced technology. That's great. It's, it's always great to get an update on, there are so many areas of expertise that you have, uh, Dr. Molinari, and that's certainly one that's really important. I want to go to a different subject now, since I'm picking your brain on so many different areas, and here's another biggie, and that is monitoring of sterilizers. Can you give us a brief update on this? Is there something we can do to monitor more than once a week? Or should, how, should, how often, how should we be doing this monitoring of our sterilizers for effectiveness? Good question. Virtually every state or every state has a weekly monitoring law where you have to monitor, keep records uh, with sport testing, et cetera. And uh, if somebody comes into the office from the state board or OSHA, this is, this is a fundamental thing that they want to make sure you are, you are uh, keeping up with. But the issue comes up, what do you do in between that weekly monitoring? Your uh, bag, uh, chemical indicators, autoclave tape, they do not prove sterilization. What has come out in dentistry is something that has been in medicine for a number of years. And these are what are called class 5 or type 5 integrator strips. These are strips that have a little glassine tube on the back with a liquid chemical. And these strips, when run in an autoclave cycle, meet all three criteria for sterilization. Time, temperature, and pressure. Mm -hmm. The other monitors that you use, the strips and tapes, meet only one or two. So what can happen with this is you can take one of these strips, put it in the center of each load that you're running in the sterilizer, and as the sterilization cycle is going, this liquid chemical moves along that tube, and there are indicators along the strip. If it gets into the safe or accept zone, and you pull out the strip at the end of the cycle, it's analogous to spore testing. And it is a good cycle. The key is, and everybody needs to understand this, these strips are not replacement for spore testing, the weekly spore testing. That is the gold standard. But it remains this is the a, gold standard today. This is additional to that. Absolutely. But this is a very, very nice way to test each cycle so that you're not left hanging when all of a sudden after a week you get a positive spore test and you go, Oh my God! What am I going to do? I don't know when the when the uh, when the sterilizer wasn't working uh, during the last week. You can check each cycle. I've seen practices do very well with this. There are a number of practices that actually put one of these strips in each pouch or in each cassette. God bless them. That's great. But at the very least, I think this is something that you could do to monitor each cycle, and they work. That, that's fantastic. I, I really like that update. And, and they work for even the sort of the fast uh, autoclaves that use a the, vacuum first. They work with oh, those oh, yes. as well. They, they work for the Statums. They work for the Bravos. They work for the Statclaves. They work for the M11s. Uh, these are very good. My, my suggestion, if I just may add w one more thing, is please. I'm, I'm something of, a, of an old timer here. I prefer that when you're putting these strips in the sterilizer, you put them in a pouch much like you have your wrapped instruments. So the conditions are the same for the strip as they are for the wrapped instruments that you have in that cycle. It's got to penetrate the same pouch, basically. Correct. Yeah. We will now pause for a word from our sponsor. Hugh Freedy is the global leader in dental instrument manufacturing, offering pediatric restorative solutions that keep you performing at your best. For more information on Hugh Freedy products, Visit www.hughfreedy.com slash AAPD crowns. We are back with Dr. John Molinari, the guru, the expert <laughs> on infection control. And Stop we're, having a we're having a great time here, John, talking <laughs> about so many different subjects. Uh, but we do have limited time, so I want to shift to the next subject, which has to do with these are all really important to us in, in practice, pediatric dentistry or general dentistry. Um, what to consider when using, selecting and using surface disinfectants? You know, we always wonder, you can't see these little bugs, you can't see the viruses, you can't see the bacteria. We spray this stuff, we wipe things down, you know, we use plastic. In Europe, they use wipe down more, I guess, and less plastic. Um, what are the basic principles that apply in selecting and using surface disinfectants? 
the principles are basically the same as what we talked about at the beginning with hand hygiene. You need to clean first, in this case, before you accomplish disinfection. So the surfaces need to be cleaned to remove as much of the uh, debris or contaminating material as possible. And then the second step, the disinfectant step, is what is going to kill the uh, selected organisms that the product has been approved for. Typically, what we look at are uh, different levels of disinfectants. I prefer the intermediate level of disinfectant where they use, and not just me, by the way, people far smarter than me have talked about this. This is an intermediate level disinfectant which uses uh, Mycobacterium bovis as a test organism. Not that you're going to get TB from countertops, but it's a resistant vegetative organism. And by killing that, you kill organisms that are less resistant than TB. So it's, it's a good benchmark organism. Including viruses? Viruses Inclu- are less... Including viruses. Yes. Including mm-hmm. viruses. And uh, this is very important because uh, people uh, come up with these things that, well, you know... Uh, <sighs> This organism, maybe it's not susceptible, maybe it's not. We're having a, uh, people are asking a lot of questions now about coronaviruses. Coronaviruses are susceptible viruses. Uh, they are envelope viruses. And so that, that group is going to definitely be susceptible to the standard intermediate level disinfectants that are out there. But the principles don't change. You clean the surfaces before you disinfect. So if you have a clean surfaces, you're just disinfecting. And following the recommended contact time is also important because companies have spent a lot of time, research money, uh, submissions to the EPA to get these criteria approved. And so if something says one minute, that's how long the surface needs to be wet. If it says five minutes, it's five minutes. If it says three minutes, three minutes. You understand. So it sounds uh, a lot like our. It sounds like a lot of what we say about using dental materials by dental professionals. That is, it's a lot more about following directions. Absolutely. Than anything else, we have to follow the directions from the manufacturer. And and what happens is typically, unfortunately, people will do a a quick wipe, and and that's and that's it. Uh, what they're seeing in hospitals, for example, is that as more more studies are being done on surface contamination and the things that can live on these surfaces, they're finding a number of organisms can remain viable or active for extended periods of time and transferred to the hands of healthcare workers or to patients. I know I'm talking hospitals here now and not dental practices, but microorganisms are transmitted the same way in both settings. It may be the degree of transmission, but we still have to adhere to the same basic principles. And so well, we're talking a lot about safety in our profession now, and absolutely one of the biggest uh, parts of safety in an environment is infection control, similar to what you would do in a hospital. And I think more and more we're having to view our practices as like hospitals. Uh, the recommendations and regulations that have been developed for hospitals are coming over into dentistry as you look at the improved and more recent infection control recommendations for dentistry because people understand that as we get more research and more information on the dental uh, issues and challenges, it's basically the same modes of transmission. It's just a degree sometimes. Plus, you have sick people in hospitals that you don't typically have in healthcare in, in dental settings. Right. Not that we know of. I like your... What I learned from you a long time ago, Dr. Molinari, is universal precautions, because we really yeah. don't know. That's right. <laughs> Key <you>. to success. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm going to shift gears again to a real biggie subject. Um, oh, yeah. These are all big, and this one is about water lines. You know, we've heard a lot about it. I hear from different people in the industry that not everybody deals with this uh, properly, or uh, unfortunately, maybe not at all in some cases. So what can we do to accomplish better infection control measures when it comes to water lines? And what about compliance and monitoring of our water lines for bacterial levels? There are a number of good approaches and products for controlling uh, microbial growth in dental water lines. The major issue is that microorganisms are very, very adaptable to different environments. And in fact, waterborne organisms can grow just about everywhere. 
we have been exposed to these organisms throughout our lives in the, in, in the form of biofilms, mists, aerosols, and generally our system tolerates it. But as we're living longer with conditions that, quite frankly, we used to die from, we're seeing a greater percentage of the population is immune compromised. And so what normally might be considered to be just a basic exposure and our immune system handles it, now suddenly these organisms can be opportunistic pathogens and transmitted to cause disease. Mm -hmm. Water is one of the ways in which this happens. Uh, I won't bore you because I could bore your audience forever about the uh, waterborne infections that, that are increasing dramatically. For dental water lines, the products work but you first need to clean the lines in order to have maintenance of low levels of organisms with a subsequent product. For example, tablets. A lot of practices use tablets, and they're great. They work very well. But periodically, you still need to treat those water lines with another agent because gradually, even with the tablets, the organism count will increase and the count will get above 500 colony-forming units, which is our minimum. So what we use is what we call a shock solution, S-H-O-C-K. It's the same as a swimming pool and for those living right, in the south. Right, same right, right. Or, or, or a hot tub. Or a hot yeah, tub. Exactly. Things will build up. Things will build right. up. And especially, uh, especially at room temperature. These organisms can grow at a variety of room temperature, at a variety of temperatures. So periodically, shocking them with tablets. Straws work. Uh, chemical solutions work, but again, they all have periods and instructions which require you to clean the lines first and then to look to maintain low levels. There are systems in place, uh, not in place, but there are systems that you can buy, uh, Vista Clear, Vista Pure as examples, that will actually treat the water coming into all of the operatories and will actually lower the microbial levels, sort of like an RO system, right, uh, these right. things work. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, we, we have varying types of water quality depending on where you are in the country. Plus, you add to the fact that you have dental water lines, which have such, such small diameters, you have a perfect environment for organisms attaching onto the walls of the tubing and forming biofilms. It's not the same as the plumbing in our homes, where we have larger diameter uh, pipes. Right. And so dental water lines are just perfect breeding grounds if you don't maintain them readily. But it sounds similar to the surface disinfection in the sense that there are clear protocols, and if we follow those directions and use those materials properly, that we can get good results. You can, and it's, it comes down to compliance. I apologize. Right. It almost sounds like I'm saying the same thing for each of the areas, but the basic principles haven't changed. Yes. One of the things, one of the things to uh, look at, and you will, you you asked about the testing, et cetera, is there are uh, companies, of course, uh, uh, ProEdge does it, Loma Linda tests it, mm -hmm. uh, Loma Linda University. There are some other companies that made doing the testing, and these are good. These are very good laboratory tests. What we need, and what is gradually coming out for people to look for, are in-office test systems. We're in the privacy, confidentiality of your mm -hmm. own practice. You can test your water to see where you are having problems and where you can correct those problems to get better water quality. And have better uh, compliance by absolutely. having confidential uh, systems, yes. Mm -hmm. Studies that were done, uh, a couple of very good studies, showed that as practices were increasing their testing frequency, they were able to find the problems, and when they correct them, the water results came out much better over a longer period of time. So it has to do with finding whatever problems you're having and correcting it, but still periodically monitoring. Yes. Recommendations are coming out now through OSAP, the Infection Control Group for Dentistry, the ADA, probably the CDC, that I think we're going to be looking at probably quarterly testing for water lines. Mm -hmm. And this is an early recommendation now. Well, we're lucky to be listening to you today. Then I think uh, we all we're all going to listen and we're going to comply with your recommendations. You're very that kind. I can assure you. Thank so you. So I have a last question for you, Dr. Molinari, and we could go on forever, but uh, we have to limit our time here. And this is a little bit shifting gears, but it's in the realm of infection control. 
And that is, you know, I used to live in Washington State, and now I heard this year that they are having this, you know, these outbreaks of measles and kids not getting vaccinations. So speaking of these uh, immunizations, what can we do to help improve the public's knowledge and the effectiveness? What is our role as healthcare professionals and the effectiveness of routine childhood immunizations and getting compliance? This is a, uh, this is a topic I'm very passionate on. Um, happen to be 75 years old. I'm one of the individuals who can remember polio. Uh, I typically tell groups, uh, look around. Many of us, many of you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the success of vaccines. Unfortunately, as we've done such a good job, uh, not eliminating, but lowering the incidence, people have forgotten about the incidence of the vaccines, uh, of, of not the incidence of the diseases, and they yes. focus on some of the adverse effects. Dental professionals can help, and I ask you to help. One of the things you can do is talk to patients about vaccines. I know, for example, pedo practices, a number of them actually checked on the vaccine history of the patients, which is good. Qu patients are going to come to you with questions about vaccines. They trust you. They value your expertise. The CDC uh, has multiple, multiple sources of good vaccine information, good science information, answering basic questions, talking about uh, the myths of vaccine that have been disproven through scientific and clinical research. I ask your uh, listeners to go to something like cdc.gov and go to immunizations, where you can find all sorts of pamphlets and information pieces that will answer questions that people seem to grapple with. Have some of these things in your practice. Be willing to talk with them. Be willing to reinforce information that's coming out from their physicians instead of listening to some of the things that are on the Internet, which are absolutely nonsense. I guess that's the only word I can use. It's not very scientific. But you can help improve the public's knowledge by getting good information out there. People are going to do the right things if they have the correct information. And particularly for us as pediatric dentists, absolutely, um, it should be an integral part. I think it is for most of us, but it's a good reminder yes. of, of our role in the entire healthcare system. The health system depends on everybody playing together to achieve the same public health results. Couldn't agree more. Thank you. Well, Dr. Molinari, this has been enlightening, and I have a feeling that this podcast will be one of the most referenced over time because, as you said earlier, it's going to stand the test of time because the principles apply. So I, I thank you so much for, for taking your time and for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Joel. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for tuning into Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to your practice, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. We look forward to seeing you here next time. Pedo Teeth Talk is brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry. If you have any questions or comments, please email info at aapd.org. We welcome your ideas for future shows and guests. For more information on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, visit aapd.org.